Welcome, and thank you for joining today's webinar on the What Works Clearinghouse Practice Guide on Designing and Delivering Career Pathways at Community Colleges. Before we get started, we want to let everyone know that we are recording the webinar so that it can be archived on IES's website. My name is Sarah Costello, and I'm a Principal Associate at APT Associates. I'm also the Project Director of the What Works Clearinghouse Postsecondary Contract, which is funded by IES. Today, I am joined by the six expert panelists who developed the practice guide. Hope Kotner is President and CEO of the Center for Occupational Research and Development. Deborah Bragg is President of Bragg and & Associates and Founding Director of Community College Research Initiatives at the University of Washington in Seattle and the, Universe, and the Office of Community College Research and Leadership at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Grant Gould is Director of Pathway Development at Futuro Health and CTE faculty at American River College. Eric Kaiser is Provost of Central Ohio Technical College. Darlene Miller is Executive Director for the National Council for Workforce Education. And Michelle Van Noy is Associate Director of the Education and Employment Research Center at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. Our panel will approach this topic from their various perspectives. Hope, Darlene, and Grant as Technical Assistance Providers, Deborah and Michelle as Researchers, Darlene, Grant, and Eric as practitioners. We will provide a brief overview of the practice guide and then walk through each of the recommendations. Our expert panel will provide strategies for implementing each of those recommendations. It is important to remember these evidence-based recommendations require thoughtful planning and resources to implement effectively. We will address the application of these recommendations during COVID and also think about ways in which they can be applied as we begin to recover from the pandemic. If you have questions about the individual recommendations, please use the chat function to submit questions to the host. We will do our best to get to the questions at the end. Any questions that we are unable to address today will be considered for our upcoming video series where we will take a deeper dive into each of the recommendations. The What Works Clearinghouse provides an online repository of high quality evidence generated by systematic reviews of existing research. Practice guides are one of the What Works Clearinghouse's flagship products to summarize findings from these reviews. Practice guides provide sets of recommendations for educators and administrators to address challenges in their classrooms, schools, and campuses. There are nearly 30 practice guides available on the What Works Clearinghouse website, covering a range of topics relevant to K-12 and post-secondary teaching and learning. This practice guide focuses on five evidence-based recommendations around how to design and deliver career pathways at community colleges. Recommendations are actionable statements for practitioners. Each recommendation in the practice guide includes examples of career pathway strategies and components and how to implement them, advice on how to overcome potential obstacles, and a summary of the research evidence that supports the recommendation. The recommendations were developed by the expert panel using information generated by the What Works Clearinghouse team's systematic evidence review. The What Works Clearinghouse team screened over 16,000 studies and reviewed 122 against the What Works Clearinghouse's rigorous standards for high quality evidence. 22 of those studies meet the What Works Clearinghouse standards. The practice guides reflect the intersection of the expert panel, expert panel professional opinion on best practice education, and evidence gleaned from the 22 studies that meet the What Works Clearinghouse standards. This practice guide adds the existing body of literature on career pathways by synthesizing the evidence from the 22 group design studies that meet What Works Clearinghouse standards to make five evidence-based recommendations around how to deliver and design career pathways to support students' educational and labor market success. The panel used the findings from the 22 studies along with their experience and expertise to assign a level of evidence to each recommendation, strong, moderate, or minimal. This slide displays each recommendation and its corresponding level of evidence. Recommendations one, two, four, and five were assigned a moderate rating, which means that there is some evidence meeting what works clearinghouse standards that the practices improve student outcomes but there may be ambiguity about whether that improvement is the direct result of the practices or whether the findings can be replicated with a diverse population of students. Recommendation three was assigned a minimal rating, which means the evidence may not meet standards or may exhibit inconsistencies. However, the panel determined that the recommendation should be included because the intervention is based on strong theory, is new and has not yet been studied, 
or is difficult to study with a rigorous research design. The target audience for this practice guide includes administrators, staff, and faculty at community colleges who are responsible for overseeing, designing, and or implementing career pathways or career and technical education initiatives, policymakers who work with community colleges, staff at American Job Centers, leaders of community-based organizations, foundations interested in supporting workforce development strategies at community colleges, employers, labor unions, industry associations, and researchers. In addition to the five recommendations, when, delivering the practice, when developing the practice guide, the expert panel also identified five overarching themes that hold relevance across multiple recommendations. These themes represent issues or topics that the expert panel believes are important to consider when developing and implementing career pathways. The first is the importance of understanding the student population. By understanding the student population, community colleges and their partners are better able to successfully design and deliver career pathways that provide appropriate forms of instruction and support services to accommodate students with different needs and capabilities. The second is the importance of aligning career pathways to industry needs. The skill sets and levels of preparation required for successful employment vary considerably from one industry to another and even from job to job within an industry. For example, career pathways that prepare students for manufacturing jobs will differ from those designed for healthcare jobs. When considering the recommendations in this guide, community colleges and their partners should determine how best to apply the recommendations in their own efforts to prepare students to thrive in the evolving industries they are pursuing. The third is the need for faculty professional development. The panel recognizes that several of the recommendations in the practice guide may require professional development for career pathways faculty. Most of the studies supporting the recommendations in this practice guide were of interventions that targeted and served older students. For this reason, the panel believes all faculty can benefit from pedagogical training that specifically addresses adult learning theory and pedagogies for effectively teaching adult learners thereby enabling them to meet students' diverse learning needs. The fourth theme is the importance of adequate time and resources. The panel believes that community college faculty and staff need ample time and resources to collaborate as they design and deliver career pathways instruction. Faculty and staff must also be afforded opportunities to identify student needs and coordinate supports that will meet those needs. The panel recognizes that funding for career pathways is not equal at all community colleges, and that the challenges presented by COVID may have exacerbated inequalities across community colleges even further. And finally, there are opportunities for more rigorous research on the effectiveness of career pathways. Much of the available research on career pathways at the community college level focuses on interventions that result in non-degree credentials for students initially lacking the math, reading, or writing skills required to successfully complete college level work. To date, Few rigorous studies report on medium and long-term educational or labor market outcomes. The panel believes that more research is needed on the full spectrum of career pathways interventions, including those that extend beyond the community college to include long-term outcomes. I'm now gonna turn it over to Hope, our panel chair, and the other panelists to take you through the recommendations in the practice guide. Thanks, Sarah. It's been a pleasure to work with IES, APT Associates, and the other panel members over the last two years to look at the available research on career pathways at community colleges and guide and shape these recommendations. The first recommendation in the practice guide can be considered an umbrella recommendation that encompasses the other four. The first recommendation is to intentionally design and structure career pathways to enable students to further their education, secure a job, and advance in employment. When designed and implemented well, career pathways offer students a clear blueprint for educational and employment advancement. This slide shows a basic career pathways model with multiple entry and exit points. In this model, students can obtain credentials that stack toward a degree, are recognized by employers, and lead to career advancement. When we drafted this recommendation, there was strong consensus among the panel to include the word intentional in the recommendation. We felt it was important to convey that career pathways programs need to be purposefully planned for them to benefit multiple stakeholders. I want to invite my colleague Grant to share his insights on this. Grant, you've overseen the development and implementation of career pathways programs at community colleges in California. 
what does it mean to be intentional in the design of career pathways? The second point I'd like to uh, call out is the importance of being student-centered in planning career pathway programs, thinking about the student experience in the program from their perspective. It is helpful to visually map out a career pathway so it's clear to the student as they are deciding what occupational path to pursue, where the career path will eventually lead them if they put in the work to obtain the credentials needed. The practice guide offers a number of very powerful visual examples of how to map out a career pathway that you can adapt for your program. Part of this is also about streamlining the choices students have to make. Rather than offering a course catalog with 100 different courses, grouping the courses into similar programs of study or career pathways and guiding students based on their interests, skills, and goals can help students make better decisions about what courses to take. Another way of being student-centered is being flexible in the instructional delivery model and course scheduling to ensure that students can access the courses they need and the time that they need them. For example, in one of the PACE studies, the college's two-year healthcare program had a short application window, and depending on when students completed the bridge program, that they may have had to wait up to one full academic year before starting the healthcare program. Colleges can work to remove these barriers from transition periods that prevent students from enrolling, persisting, and completing the Career Pathways program. Also, colleges have had to pivot quickly during the pandemic to offer online and hybrid courses. It's important, even as we come out of the pandemic, to continue thinking about how to better meet the students' needs where they are. To be really intentional, faculty must get to know their students at a much deeper level. They must constantly strive to swivel their work to meet students where they are. Thanks, Grant. I'd like to give you a moment just to go back and maybe reiterate some of your points on um, point number one for those of us who weren't able to hear you. Sure, you bet. From my personal experience, I have found that the time spent with employers during advisory meetings is time well invested in our students' success. The stronger my relationship with employers and their willingness to provide program input, the more likely my graduates are to become quickly employed by these same organizations. I strive constantly to remind my community employers that this is actually their program. Great points. Being intentional really does mean building a pathway that's responsive to employer needs and offers students credential milestones with labor market value on the path to a degree. Grant? Yes, and this goes back to my first point, Hope, about establishing and maintaining strong relationships with employers. Getting employers buy-in is so that they see the value in the certificate or credential that the community college has to offer and how those credentials stack into longer-term career pathways that enable students to advance in their careers over time. Part of building that relationship is also to share the responsibility of employee training with employers, and in this current environment, this ideal scenario is more important than ever. Community colleges across the country are seeing a decline in student enrollment, and so it is critical for employers to reimagine how they can work with community colleges in ways that leverage the strengths of the college and that benefit workers, employers, and their communities. I'm afraid that failure to continue to build these strong relationships may result for C challenges for CTE programs for years or even decades to come. Thanks, great. Thanks, Grant. All great points. We'll have a chance to talk more about employer partnerships in recommendation five, but right now let's turn to recommendation number two. Our second recommendation is to deliver contextualized or integrated basic skills instruction to accelerate students' entry into and successful completion of career pathways. Contextualized basic, basic skills instruction broadly refers to instructional strategies that make explicit connections between learning basic skills and occupational content. Integrated basic skills instruction refers to the strategy by which basic skills and occupational content instruction are delivered at the same time, often by a team that includes a basic skills instructor and a post-secondary occupational instructor. For this recommendation, I'm going to invite Michelle to share some insights based on her research in this area. Michelle, how have you seen institutions support their instructional staff in planning for and delivering 
contextualized or integrated basic skills instruction. Thanks, Hope. Uh, before I answer your question, uh, I think it's important to note that the majority of research that was identified and uh, met WWC standards for this practice guide uh, focused on interventions that serve students with lower basic skill levels. And therefore, some of the interventions focused on accelerating the entry of students into the career pathway through integrating basic skills instruction with occupational content instruction. I think this highlights the, the importance of assessment policies and practices that accurately and appropriately place students at intake and continue to help them move through programs and pathways. Um, assessments that focus on career pathway progression do a good job of understanding student needs and designing and delivering programs, instructions, and support services that are tailored to address student needs. Particularly as students have an interest from moving um, from non-credit to credit-bearing programs, students need programming and supports that help them move from basic skills progression through the transition to college level coursework. When implementing um, integrated basic skills instruction, I have observed colleges invest in professional development trainings that include a basic skills and vocational faculty. Making sure both are involved and do the trainings together is important for creating buy-in and beginning to develop the collaborative relationships that are so important between instructors. Um, another uh, really important element is providing a model for how instructors work together. Uh, there are a few uh, possible models, including the basic skills instructor participating as an active student, um, the basic skills instructor delivering part of the content, or the basic skills instructor and the occupational instructor co-delivering uh, instruction. And, and this depends largely on the institution and, and what works best in the local context. The practice guide provides some short vignettes of how these team teaching models may look in the classroom. Uh, finally, it's important to find ways to make sure that instructors have collaborative teaching time uh, to work together on their teaching strategies. Uh, they can share approaches so that occupational instructors uh, can learn pedagogical approaches that convey basic skills material, um, and basic skills instructors can learn more about the occupation so they can better situate their basic skills instruction in the occupational context. These are all important considerations. Through our collective work, we know there are a number of resources available to help instructors plan for contextualized instruction and integrated basic skills instruction. Yes, uh, Skills Common offers a lot of uh, content and open learning materials, such as lesson plans or curricula for these kinds of programs. Uh, the slide shows a figure from the practice guide highlighting how to navigate the Skills Commons website. Uh, the resources on the site can help alleviate some concerns about the time it would take to create materials for these integrated uh, programs from scratch. The panel also had conversations around addressing equity in our recommendations. Deborah, can you comment on equity issues that colleges face when planning for instruction? Yes, thanks, Hope. I'm glad you raised the issue about equity. We need to be sensitive to systemic inequities that limit the implementation of career pathways for diverse student populations. Historic inequities that educational systems need to address are more serious than ever due to the pandemic. And I plan on speaking to this more when I talk a little later about student-centered supports in Recommendation 4. However, related to this recommendation, uh, number two, as a panel, we chose to include the word accelerate in the recommendation, offer it, offering accelerated courses via contextualized or integrated instruction including co-requisite developmental courses is important for colleges to remove barriers that may be making accessing and staying in college hard for students, particularly for racially minoritized and low-income students. Thank you both for illuminating some key elements of this particular recommendation. As a reminder to all of our attendees today, if you have questions for the panelists, please enter them in the Q&A box the bottom right hand corner of the WebEx platform screen. We'll be answering questions toward the end of the webinar. The third evidence-based recommendation is to offer flexible instructional delivery schedules and models to improve credit accumulation and completion of non-degree credentials along career pathways. 
Most adult learners must balance their education and training with jobs, families, and other obligations. Flexible delivery of instruction can help students combine college with other commitments to access and progress along career pathways. Flexibility in instructional delivery can include evening or waking courses, multiple course sections, or block scheduling. It can also include use of technology to provide online or hybrid learning formats, awarding credit for prior learning experiences, or using alternative methods of assessment, such as competency-based assessments. Eric, when we were working together to develop the guide, you offered some great insights on the decisions community college administrators must make when thinking about how to improve credit attainment and accumulation. What would you say are some of the key considerations facing administrators when thinking about how to develop and implement flexible instructional delivery schedules and models? I think it's really all about the appetite for change within the institution. The phrase meeting the students where they are has turned into a bit of a cliche, but that doesn't mean that it isn't true. College doesn't find ways to meet, to meet their students where they are with regard to academic delivery are those that will win the day with students. There are certainly cost considerations that institutions will need to consider as they look at scaling up different models, but if it's important to the institution, it will happen. I'll recount a phrase I heard early on in my career that I still use to this day regarding colleges and priorities. If you really want to know what a college's priorities are, all you need to do is look at the budget. In other words, if it's a priority, you can find ways to make it happen. In light of the pandemic, most colleges had to quickly implement more flexible instru instructional delivery schedules and models for their students. What are some lessons learned from the last year and how might they speak to this recommendation in particular? I don't think that flexibility exhibited when adapting to COVID is going away. I think it's important to talk about what we were forced to do over the last year. We developed this evidence-based recommendation pre-COVID, but this past year showed us just how crucial that flexibility is. We have to come up with a better way post-COVID to offer flexible course schedules. Institutions like mine had the past year to assess where we are in this area. Now that we have introduced this flexibility because we were forced to, what are we going to do going forward? We need to look at what worked well, but also what didn't work so well. There are some folks who think we're going back to a pre-pandemic normal. I think they might be in for a rude awakening. Other colleges are going to continue to meet students where they are by offering hybrid courses and online courses. This recommendation in the practice guide doesn't seem like a recommendation anymore. It almost seems like a mandate because students will go elsewhere if one institution doesn't offer the flexibility that they're looking for. Eric, aside from seeing that institutions have what it takes to design and deliver coursework through a wider range of modalities, do you think there are any other silver linings that emerge from the pandemic? Absolutely. Uh, we have an opportunity to talk about innovations that came about because of the pandemic, many of which we want to stay. Generally, there's a newfound appetite among faculty to experiment and try new things. Some of this would have taken at least 10 years to implement, but because of the pandemic, we were forced to pivot in a matter of weeks. I've seen my faculty say, I don't want to do it that way. Maybe I can do it this way. Thanks, Eric, for your valuable observations on how this recommendation may be even more relevant now than it was when we drafted it. Now we're going to turn to recommendation four. Recommendation number four is to provide coordinated, comprehensive student supports to, to improve credit accumulation and completion of non-degree credentials along career pathways. Students often need to navigate a variety of academic and non-academic challenges that can affect their ability to complete coursework and progress toward earning a credential. These challenges include choosing the right program of study, balancing education with family and work obligations, and covering tuition costs and related educational expenses. Providing comprehensive student supports in a coordinated fashion helps students to be resilient to these challenges. Deborah, your research has led you to numerous college campuses to learn with and from institutions about some of the most promising practices in career and technical education. In your opinion, what makes this recommendation about coordinated, comprehensive student supports so important when thinking about building career pathways? We recognize institutions offer a range of supports for their students 
through the evidence we reviewed and through our collective experiences as a panel, we know that comprehensive supports are most effective if they are delivered in a coordinated way. We also know that not all students or not all supports are as comprehensive as, as they should be, and that community colleges sometimes lack the resources to deliver the supports that their students need. Resource mapping can be a powerful tool to help community colleges take stock of the, the resources available on their campuses and also in their communities. Mapping can help community colleges identify organizations in close proximity to their students to address food and housing insecurity, as well as transportation, healthcare, and childcare needs. This slide shows the kinds of questions that your college may find useful in doing resource mapping, and the practice guide provides many more examples of these. As critically important as they may be, it can be a challenge for colleges to connect students to available supports. Can you comment on that? Yes. Um, Colleges cannot expect students to know what services are available if they are not told about those services. However, community colleges are also often challenged to marshal adequate resources to deliver that full scope of services that students need using different modalities. Career pathways require a student-centered approach that carries them from onboarding to curriculum and instruction and then on to that credentialing and completion that's so important. I had the privilege of evaluating three Federal Department of Labor TACT grants with my colleagues John and Maggie Cosgrove in Missouri, and we learned a lot about implementing um, holistic student supports, and we highlight in that work uh, here today what we learned about navigators at State Fair Community College in Sedalia, Missouri. State Fair's work with navigators continues to this day, and I want to thank Dr. Brent Bates for uh, updating us uh, prior to this webinar. Though our webinar today is too short to go into great depth, I can share that the navigator program at State Fair was started to support students who struggled to stay in college not so much because of the academics, but because of the other life circumstances. This program takes into account the variability of students' lives and individualizes services to meet students' needs. The, gap, the navigators are persistent in connecting with students on a personal level, and they try not to drift back into academic advising that sometimes is, seems more comfortable uh, for them, but to, but to really focus on students' needs. The college monitors caseloads on a continuous basis, um, recognizing how important that is, and especially important during the pandemic. COVID-19, unfortunately, has, has prompted some budget cuts and reduced enrollments at state fair, as Eric mentioned, but the college has maintained its commitment to navigators who have helped students with illness and heartbreaking loss. State Fair is, um, the leadership there has observed that even though students have lost family, some of them have been required to become the major breadwinners in their family, and he attributes the success to the navigators who have helped these students sometimes stay in college and sometimes graduates who continue to stay connected to the college. Lessons learned by the State Fair leaders include carefully selecting personnel to be navigators and encouraging them to work with faculty so that they can meet the students' needs. When asked for advice, State Fair leaders said colleges should be inclusive in the design of the navigator program, ensuring that diverse opinions are built in from the beginning using data to evaluate return on investment and program impact is critical to addressing 
concerns raised about cost effectiveness of the program, again, especially in times like these. Thanks, Deborah. When we were drafting this recommendation, the panel considered the extent to which supports should be tailored to diverse student needs. We chose to highlight the role of navigators in career pathway programs. Why are career navigators an important resource for colleges to consider offering? Is a great question. Career navigators or coaches or whatever term your college uses are a great, great way for colleges to help students identify the best career fit and support their progression through career pathways. The sooner a student receives advising and career guidance tailored to the occupational sector in which they plan to seek employment, the better. When students connect to a navigator, they feel more prepared to progress and to complete their chosen pathway. And we have research that shows this outcome is the case. It is also important for navigators to have deep knowledge of employers and career pathways that can connect students to employers within sectors. Like many of, our, of the state fair examples, navigators are embedded within career pathways that have networks and where faculty have relationships uh, in the industry sector, just as Grant described earlier. This can be costly, but navigators who are more familiar with particular sectors may be able to transfer their knowledge to other industry sectors, uh, therefore for achieving some efficiencies. Thanks for sharing these insights, Deborah. We're now gonna turn to our last recommendation. The final recommendation in the practice guide is to develop and continuously leverage partnerships to prepare students and advance their labor market success. The benefits of investing in, building, and deepening employment-focused partnerships include improving the relevance and alignment of the curriculum to employer or industry needs, expanding the opportunities for students to engage meaningfully with employer partners through employer presentations, on-site visits, work-based learning opportunities and career fairs, and increasing the potential for job placement and advancement. Ultimately, improving student labor market outcomes benefits students, employers, and colleges alike. Darlene, when we introduced recommendation one earlier in our conversation, Grant mentioned successful career pathways programs rely on strong and meaningful partnerships. Can you tell us about some of the different ways you've seen community colleges successfully leverage employer employment focused partnerships? Thanks, Hope. Um, first, I wanna just say it's been such a privilege being part of all of this and I'm humbled to be here. Um, there are so many ways in which um, and colleges can engage with employers and colleges can think creatively about how to involve employers in so many things. For example, employers can support curriculum planning and review. They can support assessment of local labor market data. They can assist in student recruitment, um, provision of mentorships or work-based learning, as well as active promotion of career pathway programs. But if you ask leaders from most career and technical programs at colleges, whether they partner with employments, employers, they're gonna to say to you, oh yes, of course we do. And that makes sense, given that Perkins 5 essentially mandates collaborations by requiring each state to describe how it will support effective and meaningful collaboration between secondary schools, post-secondary institutions, and employers to provide students with expertise in and understanding of all aspects of an industry. However, I'll say that too many colleges miss the mark when it comes to strategically engaging employers. And as a former CTE Dean, I'm gonna tell you, effectively engaging with employers is a lot of work. However, the colleges that do it really well, move the relationship needle between employers advising the college to working with employers to make full strategic partnerships. So for example, effective advisory committees have a strong industry chair of the committee. An industry chair ensures that the industry partners are engaged in all aspects of the program for curriculum and program design to facilities design, to providing supports to students in hiring and prep for work. And most importantly, they ensure currency so that the program is educating learners for the jobs that are currently in the local labor market and for the jobs of the future. 
colleges should also be doing assessments to make sure that they have the right employers at the table. You know, it's, if not, they need to work on filling the gaps. In our work, NCWE's work with colleges around employer engagement, we recommend that colleges do develop an employer engagement plan that includes both internal and external scanning of who and why. Advisory committees, for example, should contain a mix of HR individuals, supervisory individuals, and maybe even program graduates who bring to the table knowledge regarding what they learned, was it a value to their employment, and what the colleges should be, do, should be doing to redesign or enhance the curriculum. And finally, colleges should also make sure they're asking employers to provide to them or review with them relevant, timely labor market data that will support decisions about design and implementation of career pathway programs. I'm glad you brought this up, Darlene. Let's talk some about the types of data that would be most helpful for colleges and their partners to dive into together. So something the panel talked about when we were developing the PAC practice guide is that college administrators must often have honest but difficult conversations with their employer partners. For example, for before creating a career pathway program or certificates along the program, um, it would be a good idea to look at the data to tell whether or not there are really jobs along the pathway that pay wages that lead to a family sustaining opportunity. In other words, you need to make sure the certificates really lead to quality jobs so that you're not simply creating pathways and certificates that lead the students to nowhere. The data also needs to verify the entry points and exit points. Does certificate A really lead to employment? If I continue to certificate B, will I see a wage gain? You need to be looking at the demand along the pathway as the wages to ensure that program completers again can engage family sustaining employment. There's so many good tools available that look at real time labor market data, but way too often at the college, the institutional researcher has the access to those tools when those tools really need to be in the hands of the CTE dean. And back to the advisory committees. They need to be looking at that local labor market data too. Um, NCD just did a NCW just had a contract to do analysis of some programs at a college. In a number of instances, we found that even though the advisory committee had participated in the development of the career pathways, some of these employers were not using the college's certificate and degrees in their hiring processes. When we looked at data from MC, we found that there were employers for advisory committees who didn't even require the college certificates in their job posting. So the dean needs to see the local data and the advisory committee needs to select, see the local data as well. It's good for employers to see wage data to ensure that they're play, paying their employees commensurate with the skills they've obtained. Continuing on with your point about having honest conversations, one of the potential obstacles we identified in the practice guide is that employers may not understand the value of partnering with community colleges to help train workers who are not yet their employees. Do you have suggestions for how colleges can better help employers understand the value of partnering? Hey, that's a really great point. And I'll tell you, when I was a college non college president, I could talk nonstop about the value of partnering with the college. But too often I felt as if I was talking to myself or in an echo chamber. But if I asked an advisory committee chair to talk to their peers about partnering with the college, they listened. I used to do an event called Breakfast with the President as a way to get more industry folks engaged with the college. I didn't invite the participants. We asked our advisory committee members and our other industry friends to invite their peers. It's another really good way to use your advisory committee members and your employer partners and friends in a strategic fashion. Put them in charge of extolling the value of working with the college. Peers respond so much better to their own peers and are more willing and more likely to be engaged with the college if they hear it from their peers in the community. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it back to Sarah. Thanks, Darlene. Um, as our panelists were walking through each of the recommendations in the practice guide, participants were posting some really great questions in the chat box. Um, we'll try to see how many we can get to in the time remaining. I've done my best to sort them. 
Um, and I think we'll actually, I'm going to put this one right back to you, Darlene, because I think this builds on something you were just speaking about. And someone asked, do you see value in partnering with organizations like Burning Glass and MC that scrape the internet for details on the local job market and employer needs? Oh, absolutely. I'm a big, big proponent of using those tools for labor market data. And as I said earlier, it is so important to get that into the hands of the, the CTE dean. Um, you know, I, I, I've worked with a number of colleges where they've purchased those tools and they give them to the institutional researcher to use for accreditation purposes or others. And the person who needs that data and that information the most is that dean to be able to articulate what's going on in those programs with the faculty and with their advisory committees. Thanks. Does anyone else on the panel have anything to add about working with um, those types of data? Thanks, Sarah. I would just uh, echo Darlene's comments. Uh, my college works uh, with AMZ and have used it um, not only in the past to identify programs that we weren't serving uh, or that programs that we were looking to create, but also uh, when we talk about having hard conversations, looking at programs that were not producing the wage outcomes that we needed uh, in order to, again, be very transparent with our students on the on the front end and say, this is the wage outcome that you'll be earning upon graduation. So uh, you don't have to go it alone. Those programs are incredibly, incredibly helpful. Uh, and they do give you that snapshot in time of what the earnings look like, what the demand looks like, and what the potential for down the road uh, in terms of growth looks like. I would just add to that from some current research that I'm doing, I think there's a lot of different ways that institutions can think about embedding the use of these data across different functions and for different audiences. So from program design to you know, figuring out what skills to include, figure out which programs to keep and to remove, to advising students, marketing programs, and, and, and think about sort of ways to institutionalize um, the use of the data and, and get it out to a broader audience. There's a lot of uses that we're seeing out in the field right now um, as these data become more sophisticated. And there's many sources, not just the vendors, state data and longitudinal data data wage outcomes data. There's a lot, a lot that's out there that wasn't out there, say, 10 years ago. Great. Thank you all. Um, so I have a, there's a comment here, obviously, about we know that COVID has had an impact on so many parts of our economy. Hope, I think I'm going to ask you to take this one. I'm wondering, um, well, actually, a participant is wondering, do you think that career pathways will play a more important role in workforce development in a post-COVID world? And if so, how? I do think so. Um, yes, and I think because, like we talked about earlier on in our conversation this afternoon, um, practitioners have been very intentional in designing career pathways, particularly over the past few years, being very informed um, about um, the local labor markets, developing those pathways in partnership with employers. And then when you embed those stackable credentials in partnership with your employers, so making sure they are truly um, locally responsive, I think that just provides another opportunity to really, um, it's the beauty of the flexibility, if you will, of career pathways, because we know that um, the future of work is gonna require that all learners, um, all, all um, workers rather, continue to be learners throughout their careers and career pathways and those stackable credentials embedded within pathways are a perfect opportunity to allow that lifelong learning to occur, making sure that it's aligned to the credentials that are really truly needed in the local labor market. Thanks, Hope. Um, somewhat connected in terms of thinking about lifelong learning. I wanna take this back to thinking about the folks who are actually providing the instruction at community colleges who are working with career pathways. So um, there was a comment here. Michelle mentioned professional development as a part of the recommendation on integrated basic skills instruction. And Grant, I know this is something I recall you had talked about this a lot when we were developing the practice guide. So I wanna ask you, Grant, maybe you could say a few words about how important is professional development or training um, for other parts of designing career pathways? Thanks, Sarah. I, you know, I think with even with the pandemic that we've gone through, we've found that a lot of faculty are hungry for new techniques and strategies to work with their adult learners. And it's been exacerbated as both the student and the faculty have had to shift and pivot so significantly to meet the students' needs and the employer needs. And, and, and clearly, we're in a point, a point now where faculty are hungry for that professional development to make sure that they're providing the best instruction they can, which again aligns to making success students who become future employees. Great. 
Um, Eric, I have a question that came up in the chat. I'm going to pitch over to you. Um, I think it's actually a two-part, um, it's either related or it's a two-part question. It said, can I have some more information about the flexible delivery schedules? For us, we use, we use eight-week courses, hybrid teams. Do you have other options that you use? Yeah, so great question. I, I think the, the two identified there are going to, to continue to be incredibly popular. Uh, students, first off, I, I would say there's a lot of data out there already uh, showing the benefits of what you would call a condensed term or a, a, a midweeks or a midterm start. We don't use the term eight week uh, because it's not exactly eight weeks and you get that stuck in a student's head and they uh, they tend to go with it. So um, we call it a first term and a second term start. I think those are incredibly beneficial to two different types of audiences. One, uh, students that miss your initial registration period, you're now not locking them out of engaging with you in the same semester. Secondarily, students that just say, look, I can, even if it's intense, I can do one or two of these courses, but that's all that I can handle at a time. I can't sign up for four, four classes at the same time. So by giving them the ability to engage potentially one, maybe two classes in the first term, one, maybe two classes in the second term, you've now given that student the ability to be full time while not fighting off four courses at the same time that they have to monitor. So I do believe those split term classes are going to continue to gain in popularity. Certainly hybrid offerings where you're not requiring students to come to campus every day or every other day of the week. Uh, again, pandemic life has has shown us that the need to uh, adjust the way that we think about how we deliver lectures, how we do our labs, uh, when we require students to be on ground, and when are the times that that maybe now, again, a year into this thing, that we're saying, you know, we we can do that differently and we can do it better for those students who really could maybe only commit to being with us for one day a week. Um, on the other side of that, are there other ways? Absolutely. Uh, my experience with competency-based education, uh, I think CDE is going to continue to grow in popularity, just given that flexible pace that it creates. It allows students to work at, and learn at a pace that works for them, as opposed to tying it back to an academic calendar. So students can accelerate in areas that they're familiar with or they have prior work or learning experience and decelerate in areas that they need to spend some more time in. Um, so I, I think those are definitely some of the more popular uh, methods that I think are gonna, they're gonna hold true uh, outside post pandemic that, that students are gonna say, yeah, you know, I, I like the ability to do, um, do things differently than, than what I thought. I would share just lastly, Sarah, one thing that's kind of surprised me that I've seen in this last semester in particular, for as much as we bashed on uh, the remote delivery and, oh, it's just, you know, uh, Zoom, Zoom fatigue and too much Zoom, students have actually said, you know what, for the lecture portion of the class, I like that. I'm okay with that. Uh, so I think you're going to continue to see delivery of lectures uh, via Zoom um, to a wide array. So we're using uh, a delivery model that we're calling, and it's not our term, this has been around, uh, high flex, where you can have students in a live classroom while also uh, giving that lecture via Zoom. And there are technologies out there that help you do that seamlessly, where students can participate on a wide array of devices you could have students in the classroom on iPads. So you could have a student at their home on an iPad, computer, what have you, uh, engaging in and, um, you know, being actively engaged regardless of whether or not they're in the actual classroom. Hey, Sarah, could I jump in for a second on that too? I mean, I think another Thanks. one of the great parts about this um, being a shorter terms and as, as Eric called them, term A and term B, is um, if anybody's been following sort of the strata um, surveys of adults. The adults are saying, look, I want to come back. I need to come back. I need to get a certification quickly to go to work. And what that allows you to do is, is you know, use your shorter term in sort of creating a boot camp where you can boot camp a certificate into that eight week term. Somebody who can only come to school for a short period of time can come in that short period of time, get that certification, and go back to work quickly. And I think it works really great for those students who, who want to learn that way and want to learn through that sort of boot camp type format. 
and Sarah, I don't, I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but Darlene just brought up something. I'm not going to get too inside baseball with it, but I will tell you, um, and folks can feel free to, to connect with me offline. There are ways for colleges to use their CARES money and engage with students just like Darlene just talked about, those that need to get in and get that eight weeks and be done. So think about don't think about your cares money as this well you know we're going to fund a or b because that's what we've done before get outside of that box figure out ways from the student aid portion where you might be able to partner with employers to say hey what if we kind of split the tab here and you allow this student to go full time it'll only take eight weeks but let them go full time so that we can get them through the material and we'll figure out on the back end wages and, and things of that nature those are the unique partnerships that I think, uh, again, we've got to be able to think outside of the box now. And I, I think an employer, I know we've already visited with some in our area that are all over that because it gets them their employees quicker, uh, but it also does allow that, that employee to receive the training in that shortened amount of time. Thanks, Eric. Um, I have a related question that came in through the chat. Um, and maybe it's not quite as easy to, to work with federal funding this way, but there's a question about, can we embed federal work study into more of these community college programs? The IES slash NCES data estimate um, through survey data suggests that only 2% of community college students get federal work study, 2%. Um, I, I, maybe I'll go with Eric and then Darlene, if anyone else, I'm thinking about our folks who've been in the college administrator position, but can you comment on that, thinking about the, the use of federal work study? Uh, we certainly use them at our institution. Um, I would tell you, you need to work with your director of financial aid. That's going to be your biggest ally within the institution. They know those rules inside now. I'm not going to proclaim to be an expert in it, uh, but it is absolutely something that that we use and will continue to engage with even at a higher level as, as we have more students return to campus. And uh, the feds did allow those students to stay engaged and continue working even during the pandemic. So. Um, I know, again, the financial aid folks live, live, eat, and breathe that stuff, and, and they, they likely your financial aid director is going to have that information. So I would say absolutely engage with them. Um, I, I, I know that that statistic, I've heard that statistic before, and, and I got to think it's just because there's not a whole lot of, um, it, it isn't brought to attention as much as maybe it should be in terms of the availability of, of those uh, funds for students in the community college. Anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I wanted to add to that. I think there's a lot of good research showing that um, on, on campus employment that is done through federal work study is very beneficial for students in terms of completion. Um, and that's been all the research that's been done on on campus employment. Um, there's also a lot of opportunities for students to do off campus employment that could be potentially in positions related to what they're studying. And that hasn't been done very much at two year or for your institutions for that matter. Um, but to me, I think if you're thinking about work and learn models and career pathways, there's a lot of potential there, but it requires in my mind, a reshifting and thinking about work study from a financial aid program to a career preparation program. That's also a financial aid program. And, and that, you know, certainly has a lot of institutional implications about where it's situated and how it's operated, but it requires more integration with other college activities. But the benefits to students, I think, are hugely untapped and something that, you know, really there's a lot of opportunity to, to, to help students. Sarah, just to, to piggyback on what Michelle said it, it, um, it's interesting, as you pointed out, the, the body of research that we had to use to create the guide um, didn't have a lot about some interventions and, uh, you know, work study, work based learning, apprenticeships, the, the kind of work and, and, uh, and learn models that Michelle was indicating. I think these are all very rich and potentially you know, extremely valuable as we move forward. Um, and we, I think as a panel, we would love to see more work in that area. We didn't see it in the 22 studies, um, so we could talk a lot about it in our guide, but that doesn't mean that we don't think it's extremely important and, and should be part of these initiatives moving forward. You know, and I just would like to add, um, you know, Eric said something that's really important. I learned really on in my career as a CTE dean to make the director of financial aid my best friend. Because when I was trying to create stackable credentials, I needed to make sure I wasn't doing anything 
that was going to, you know, affect a student's ability to get financial aid. So even though I'll tell you, I tangled a lot, I figured out that she was one of the most important people to work with on campus, because if I was going to successfully do this, I needed her support to do it. So your director of financial aid is someone who should be really your best friend when you're working with career pathways. Thanks, Darlene. So with that, um, we do have a few other questions in the chat, but I think we're going to save those for, like, as we mentioned, digging into some of the individual recommendations in our, our videos. We did get um, a, a few other questions that came through about, can I get a copy of this presentation, the slide? Where can I get the practice guide? So we have some information here. Um, and we also will be sending out a link after this recording is available to be, it will be posted on IES's website and we'll make sure that we include in that email the direct link to the practice guide. But at this time, I wanna thank Hope, Deborah, Grant, Eric, Darlene, and Michelle um, for sharing your thoughts and your insights with us today. Um, as you can see here, the, the Career Pathways Practice Guide is available through the What Works Clearinghouse website. Um, I've been searching a lot when I need to get it easily, Career Pathways Practice Guide, and it has been coming up through What Works Clearinghouse. Um, we'll be taking a deeper dive into each of the five recommendations in a five-part video series. The first batch of recordings will be available on IES's website in May, and each video will be about a half hour long. It will feature one of our expert panelists here today with one or two practitioners, and they'll be talking more about how they've actually seen the recommendations in action at a community college. Um, anyone who registered for this webinar today will receive an email notification when those videos are available. So to today's attendees, I want to thank you for joining us and thank you for all that you are doing to support post-secondary learning during these trying times. Thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to IES. I hope everyone takes care and uh, stay safe. Bye-bye.